Hello and praise the Lord, everybody. I'm Pastor Joshua Glick. And I'm Leah Glick. And we're part of the Journey Up Church. We're so excited to have each and every one of you join us here today for another edition of our cyber service. If you enjoyed today's service or if it ministered to you in any way, please feel free to like it, comment, reach out to us. Um, if you feel like someone else could use it, please feel free to share it. And more importantly, if you need a Bible study or would like to learn more about God, reach out to us. We would be more than happy to sit down with you and talk about God and, and just go on this journey with you. And for our Journey Up family, we now also have the ability to give online. And so to do that, you can go to our website at Our Journey Up. Dot org. We pray today that this message blesses you and go with God in Jesus' name. Well, hello everybody and praise the Lord. It's so good to have everybody with us again for another cyber service here on a Wednesday evening. And I'm so excited to be with each and every one of you all again. And uh, we have an ex another exciting lesson today. I know we've been, uh, I've been saying that almost, it seems like uh, every single lesson that we go through, but I'm, this is the lesson of all lessons, I, I promise you. And this is a very, very exciting lesson. It's important to each and every one of us uh, to, to know and to understand uh, the contents of this lesson today. It could mean the difference between heaven and hell in your life. And so uh, uh, let's. We, I want to dig right into the meat of the word and to engage uh, in this study here uh, today. But uh, last week we did cover uh, the life of Christ, and today we are going to be covering uh, the birth of the church, the birth of the New Testament church, and and this is what it's all about right here. So on the onset of this uh, lesson, why don't we just engage in prayer today and let's ask God that he would uh, bless our minds and bless our hearts and that his spirit would be with us as we learn the word together. Amen. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We praise you, God. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy. God, I thank you, Lord God, for the word of God. Amen. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. And I pray, God, let illumination go forth in this lesson, God, this evening. Let revelation go forth in this lesson this evening, God, and help us to apply it or have application of this lesson into our lives so that not only will we be a hearer of the word, but that we may be a doer of the word as well. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Praise God. Well, we're going to be talking about the birth of the church. And this is what, like I said, this is what it's all about. If there's any type of a church I want the Journey Up Church to be like, it's the New Testament church. And what better way to know uh, 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 how the New Testament church should be or to act or to uh, how it should uh, uh, portray itself even in the hour in which we live today? Well, we need to search the scriptures and we need to see exactly how the New Testament church acted then. And I know the culture changes and uh, uh, a lot has changed from then unto now. However, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still moves and touches and blesses. And the church as well should have the same type of relationship with God, the same type of fire, the same type of Holy Ghost power, the same type of spirit moving and operating in their hearts and lives uh, as it was back then and as it should be today as well. So we're going to talk about our first slide here. It talks about uh, the birth of the church. Now, just prior to uh, his ascension, Jesus told his disciples not to begin their ministry yet, but to wait in the city of Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. And without a baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Great Commission would have been a hopeless task to be able to fulfill. Without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, a great compassion would have been a hopeless task as well. Now, uh, the preaching of the gospel was to be done in the power and in the inspiration of the Spirit. In Acts 
chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus promised the disciples power. He, uh, uh, the Holy Ghost was, was that power that he promised and he was uh, to give to his people. And it would extend the influence of the disciples' ministry to the uttermost parts of the earth, even unto us today. And it was to begin at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Now about now, to, to just to uh, talk a little bit about the day of Pentecost, we had about uh, 120 of Jesus' disciples. They all gathered themselves together in an upper room in Jerusalem. And among those uh, were Mary, the mother of Jesus. Check out Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. His brothers were there. The 12 apostles were there. Uh, for approximately 7 to 10 days, they all remained there in constant prayer and in supplication. And then the Jewish feast day of Pentecost arrived. Now the disciples were all in one accord, and they were all in, in one place, in their uh, one accord in their worship uh, and supplication unto God and in prayer. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 records the details of this first glory glorious outpouring of the Holy Ghost. The place where they were sitting was so overwhelmed by the sound of a rushing mighty wind that came from heaven. Praise God. Acts chapter 2 and verse 3 records another supernatural event immediately following that wind that came rushing in. The scripture says, cloven tongues like flames of fire appeared and sat upon each of them. Now, of the many wonderful things that took place in the upper room, the greatest miracle was the one that was recorded in verse 4. It says, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues or languages as a Spirit gave them the utterance. And when they were all filled with the Spirit, the initial sign of the baptism of the Holy Ghost was then given. It was uh, provided. The, the disciples began to speak with other tongues, as Scripture says, glorifying God in languages that they had never learned, that they had never known before. Now let's move on to our next slide here. Uh, the Feast of Pentecost then was a holy day in Israel 50 days after the Passover. And Jews from all over the Roman Empire uh, were gathered together in Jerusalem. The news spread through the city of the events that took place in the upper room. Uh, a great multitude gathered just to see what was going on, just to see what was happening there. And the disciples were still rejoicing and still speaking in tongues until under the intoxicating influence of the Holy Ghost. Jesus had promised the disciples in John chapter 16, verses 22 through 24, that the day would soon come when their hearts would be filled with a joy that no one could take from them. The baptism of the Holy Ghost fulfilled that promise. The apostle Peter later described it as joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. And, as, and, and so... We also see has how Peter also then goes up the steps forward to preach. Uh, Peter heard their false accusations. They, they thought that everybody in that upper room was drunk. Uh, the, the crowds people did. So Peter got up. He heard all of their false accusations and uh, of, of, the, of the people being drunk and immediately stood up uh, in the disciples' defense. He was not the same fearful man, mind you, uh, who had cowardly denied the Lord Jesus who was being led to his crucifixion. But it was now, it was a strong Simon Peter, a bold Simon Peter. And he addressed the crowd that was gathered to see this marvelous event about what was going on there in that upper room. It was a man who had been given power from on high through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It changed Peter. Hallelujah. And it was the man, Jesus for Saul, when he delivered, when he declared, should I say, when he declared that he would give Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Peter, he was now ready. Now, since he had the power of the Holy Ghost working inside of him, you see, he was now ready to begin to use those keys in his life. And so first, the new, the, the, so Peter proclaimed the very first New Testament sermon. 
he preached to them about the same precious Lord whom they denied, who he denied. And this time, his words were not words of defeat, or they were not words that were cowardly, but they were words that rang forth with authority. They were words that rang forth with victory and power. Amen. And, and, and Peter preached with power, not that only the anointing that the Holy Ghost could, could provide. And, and let me just say this. You want to hear some good preaching. You want to hear some good sermons. You want to hear from somebody with a with a word of the Lord that's that could be directed right for you in this day and age in your life. Then you need to find a preacher or a pastor that's full of the power of the Holy Ghost. That's full of the of God's anointing in their lives. You need a you need to find a preacher, amen, that is full of the of God's power in his life. And so Peter, his message, uh, his message began, he said, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is, but the third hour of the day. This is all found in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. And so Peter then, he declared that the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, that in the last days God would pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. That's in Joel 2.28. Now, a, wor a worldwide outpouring of the Holy Ghost with the accompanying initial sign of speaking in other tongues would be God's uh, blessing upon humanity throughout the church age. It's still happening in this day and age today. He preached to them the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ and told them that their own wicked hands were guilty of His death on Calvary. Now, Peter climaxed his sermon by declaring that God had made that same Jesus who they crucified both Lord and Christ. Conviction uh, gripped the hearts of the people uh, as Peter preached his inspired sermon unto them. And in desperation and in a heartfelt sincerity, uh, uh, they cried out to Peter and to the rest of the apostles. They said this in Acts chapter 2, verse 10. 37, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Amen. What shall we do? Now, an honest question always deserves an honest answer, especially when people's destiny in eternity is at stake. Their question was, what shall we do? Was so important, and that should be so important in your life as well. They wanted to know how, how they could be saved. The responsibility rested squarely then on Peter's shoulders to deliver to the multitude the proper New Testament plan of salvation. Peter had been given the keys to the kingdom, remember. And for the, for the first time, he was about to use those keys and unlock the door of salvation to those that would hear his words. So without hesitation and with the full support of the other apostles, Peter's voice boomed, I believe, forth the answer to the thousands of hungry listeners who stood before him. Peter said this. His response was found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. He said, somebody hear me tonight. He said, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. How beautiful, how wonderful a message that is. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive that gift, that precious gift of the Holy Ghost. By simply obeying God's command to repent of their sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, they were promised the same glorious baptism of the Holy Ghost to all believers throughout the church age until Jesus Christ comes back again. Acts 2 and 39 says, For that promise, the gift of the Holy Ghost, that promise is unto you and is to your children and is to all that that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
Hmm. Peter spoke many words, exhorting the crowd to save themselves without hesitation, without delay. And by the time Peter was finished, the word of God had done its work. The Bible says that 3,000 souls repented or they, they, they presented themselves for baptism. I believe they repented. They presented themselves for baptism in the precious name of Jesus Christ. We can be confident that God fulfilled His promise and baptized them as well with the gift of the Holy Ghost. The mighty blessings of God were falling once again in Jerusalem. Let's move on. Let's take a look at these three steps. Repentance, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let's examine those things a little bit closer. It is so important that we fundamentally uh, get the concept of these three steps because these are the steps for salvation. Amen. Peter gave it. That was the first message preached in the New Testament. It was the birthing point of the New Testament church, and we've got to know that today. The message hasn't changed the Bible does not; it has not changed. Amen. The message is still short today, so let's take a closer look at these three steps. Let's take a look at our next slide here on repentance. Now, repentance is the first of the three steps of God's plan of salvation that was delivered on the day of Pentecost. Uh, to repent, it means to experience godly sorrow and conviction for past sins and to turn resolutely from them. Now, godly sorrow works repentance, the scripture says. And so oftentimes when you are repenting or going through the repentance process to God, you may feel tears. You may physically cry into the Lord as you're talking to God and feeling sorry for everything that you may have done in your past. Uh, whatever sin, whatever it was uh, in your life that maybe you had had done or accomplished. Amen. Let me say this, that God's love is greater. God's forgiving power is bigger than whatever you may have done in your life. Hallelujah. God has all power in heaven and earth as given unto him. And, and hallelujah, his power. Power and love is greater. There's no, there's no sin too great. There's, there's nothing that you can, can, can do. Uh, uh, as long, I firmly believe. I, I know there, uh, uh, we can talk about reprobate minds and things of that nature. But I believe that everybody that's listening to this video tonight, if you, uh, uh, if you are listening under the sound of my voice, I believe there's an opportunity for repentance for you here today. And, and, and if God was giving somebody over to a reprobate mind, uh, then I don't believe or I don't feel like you would even be listening to this video. Uh, so I, I can I can say that with, with, with assurance that uh, uh, you can repent tonight and you can reach out to God and feel uh, 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 godly sorrow and, uh, uh, and press on towards uh, uh, the mark in Christ Jesus. Now, like I said, uh, repentance is, uh, that means to experience godly sorrow and conviction for your past sins and then to resolutely turn away from them. Repentance isn't, doesn't mean that you're sorry when you got, get caught. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Repentance isn't just uh, regretting the fact that you got caught in your sin. But repentance is something much deeper than that. It says, God, I am so sorry for what I've done. Or, God, I am so sorry for who I have been in my life. And forgive me and help me to change my life, to turn my life around, and to live for you. Hallelujah. Repentance is the act of turning away from a life of sin and moving towards a life towards Christ. The scriptures stress in the strongest terms that repentance is absolutely essential to salvation. Take a look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Because these cities failed to repent, they were destroyed by fire and brimstone. That was Genesis chapter 12. Take a look at Jonah. The people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. And Jesus said this fact would condemn those who refuse to repent in our generation. That's Matthew chapter 12 and verse 41. Take a look at John the Baptist. Uh, he commanded that everyone in Judea should repent and prepare their hearts for the kingdom of heaven. 
Look at Jesus Christ's words himself. Jesus proclaimed in Luke 13 and 3, he said, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Look at the Great Commission, the last words of Jesus before his ascension. He commanded repentance. Luke chapter 24 in verse 47. And again, on the day of Pentecost, repentance is the very first step. It is the initial step in the plan of salvation preached by Peter and the other apostles in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Now let's move on to the next slide here. Uh, on being buried with him in baptism. The next thing Peter commanded the crowd on the day of Pentecost to do was to be baptized. Now, the Word of God prescribes only one mode of water baptism, and that is baptism by immersion. The word baptism is derived from the Greek word baptizo, which literally means to dip, to plunge, or to immerse. Immersion is important because only this mode preserves the significance of baptism as a burial in our lives. Repentance in the Bible is symbolic of death to sin and to the ungodly life before the encounter with Jesus Christ. Spiritually speaking, when a person repents, he is actually coming to the cross of Calvary. The old carnal nature is being crucified with Christ. What you are doing, you're saying, God, not my will, but let thy will be done. I'm dying out to my way. I'm dying out to my will. I'm dying out to my old habits, my old lifestyles, my old sins. I'm dying out to all of that. And I'm coming to you, Jesus. Amen. So repentance is a type of coming to, to Christ. Uh, uh, where the old carnal nature is crucified with Christ. So, but after the death of sin, a, person, a person's got to be buried. So Romans 6 and 4 says this, We are buried with Him by baptism unto death. Now in baptism, a person follows Jesus to the grave. But how, how is a person buried? Is he sprinkled with just a few handfuls of dirt for burial. When you go bury somebody, or if you have ever been to a, a, a graveside service, uh, they don't just uh, put a few sprinkles of dirt upon that individual that's being buried. No, they, they immerse them in the ground, and then they feel the dirt on top of that uh, uh, person. And so likewise, likewise, when we are buried with Kim in baptism, we are immersed. We go down into a watery grave. We are buried buried with him in baptism. Hallelujah. That's why, that's why it makes a difference. I, I wonder sometimes, and uh, I wonder sometimes if, if, if those that are just sprinkled in a baptism, I wonder, I wonder if that doesn't stink in the nostrils of God. Just as a dead body or a carcass just being sprinkled in dirt would stink in our in our uh, uh, nostrils. But it's important. It's important the way you're baptized. And that I firmly believe in, 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 to be baptized, you have to be immersed. In the name of Jesus. Moreover, Christian water baptism should be performed by invoking the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus commanded the apostles in Matthew 28 and 19 to baptize in the name. Notice that singular. Notice it doesn't say names. It says in the name of of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are titles of the one God that reveal aspects of His relationship to humanity. God has revealed Himself as the Father in creation. He revealed Himself as the Son for our redemption. And He is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit who regenerates and dwells within the believer today. And there is one supreme name of salvation that encompasses uh, these three titles and the works that they represent. Amen. That name is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says this. It says that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Again, Acts 4 and 12. 
The apostles understood. They understood this scripture, you see. They understood, they understood this when they received the great commission from Jesus, that they were to baptize in the one singular name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost. And that name is Jesus. The Father was revealed in the name of Jesus. Look at John chapter 5 and verse 43. The name was given to the Son. Of course, his name was Jesus. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. The Holy Ghost comes in the name of Jesus. Look at John chapter 14 and verse 26. So Jesus opened the disciples' understanding to this great truth of the name of Jesus. See uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through 47. Uh, For this reason, the apostles always, in every instance, in every place of Scripture, they obeyed Matthew 28, 19 by baptizing in the name of Jesus for the remission of of sins. You check it out. Every instance they baptize in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Acts chapter 8, verse 16, Acts chapter 10, verse 48, Acts chapter 19 and verse 5, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. It was all in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Lord Jesus. They understood exactly what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 28, 16. Amen. To be to baptize in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you received the Holy Ghost? Let's look at the next slide here. The third step in the plan of salvation given to us in Acts 2.38 is to receive, to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus himself spoke of this experience. He foretold this glorious experience in John 3 and 5 when he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This verse establishes the absolute necessity of receiving the Holy Ghost in your life. Paul preached it. The essentiality of receiving the wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost is further emphasized by the words of the Apostle Paul when he said uh, in Romans 8 and 9, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Receiving this gift is a beautiful privilege. It's a gift. It's an opportunity purchased for us by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the greatest experience that is ever given. Christ actually comes and takes up his abode in a human body or in a human temple. Hallelujah. That body becomes the very temple of the Almighty God. Remember in a several lessons back, we talked about the Old Testament tabernacle and how to access or get into the presence of God and to where the Lord would abide and dwell. Well, Flip the page now to the New Testament. We are the temple of God. We are a place that houses the very presence of God. And we have an opportunity where the Spirit of God can come and dwell in us. That is where the gift of the Holy Ghost takes place inside of our hearts and lives. Peter told about it. The Apostle Peter spoke about it in Acts uh, 2.38 about the Holy Ghost experience. He later described the feeling when the Creator dwells within His creation through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said in Romans 14 and 17 that it is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hallelujah. Paul described it as righteousness and peace and joy. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is promised to everybody, to all who obey God's command to repent and who exercise their faith in Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at the next slide here on the evidence of the Holy Ghost. How do you know that you have the Holy Ghost? What is the evidence? Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 records the initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost. When the believers in the upper room spoke in other tongues, do Does everybody, do do all speak with tongues when they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? Does that happen to everybody when they receive that great gift? This is a, I I think this is a legitimate question that one that deserves really a sincere and honest consideration. 
in considering the necessity of speaking with other tongues, the Bible is really, it's our only source of information. I'm not going to go to any other source or any other book, but I want to see what the Word of God has to say about this topic or subject. Uh, among 120 individuals that was in that upper room, we, we see Mary, the mother of Jesus. We see Jesus' four half-brothers. We see all the, the apostles uh, there, and they all spoke in other tongues when they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. We see how the, the Samaritans received the Holy Ghost. The Samaritans received the same experience, and a miraculous outward sign occurred to tell everyone uh, when people received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Even Simon the sorcerer knew that they had received a heavenly gift, and, and, and it was so evident that he sought to buy that power to bestow s- uh, such a miraculous sign as well in Acts chapter 8, verses 13 through 17. Look at the Gentiles. The Holy Ghost fell on Cornelius and other Gentiles, and they spoke with other tongues. The sign convinced the skeptical Jewish Christians that the Gentiles had received as well the Holy Ghost. And this sign alone, speaking in other tongues, it was sufficient for Peter to proclaim that the Gentiles had received the very same Pentecostal experience. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. And chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. And finally, in Acts 19, 1 through 6, a group of John the Baptist's disciples, they were rebaptized in Jesus' name by the Apostle Paul. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost as evidenced by speaking in other tongues. Hallelujah. If you've been baptized before and you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name, I encourage you to get baptized again. Amen. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ by immersion. And the accompanying sign of speaking with tongues is either stated or strongly implied in every outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's recorded in the book of Acts. So yes, it is important. Yes, it is is the evidence of, of having received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now let's look and see what the Holy Ghost does in your life. The Spirit gives immortality at Christ's return as we take a look at the next slide here on the power of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost bestows a very, uh, it bestows the very power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, according to Romans 8 and 11, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. See also Romans 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, verses 51 through 53, that same spirit that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead Amen. That's that's the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what's going to give us the power as well that will resurrect us. Amen. The Spirit gives also gives us power. The baptism of the Holy Ghost gives the believer tremendous power to witness for the Lord. Without the Holy Ghost, the early disciples would have been powerless to save the hostile world of that day. But through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Ghost within them, they were able to conquer even the mighty Roman Empire with the good news of Calvary. This same power is available today if people will only have the faith to reach out and to claim it for themselves. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, that ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Hallelujah. Power to witness, power, amen, to to have a victorious life in Jesus Christ. Also, the Spirit teaches. The Bible is not merely a product of human thinking and ability. The Scripture says in, in 2 Peter 1 and 21, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Since it required the inspiration of the Spirit for the writing of the Scriptures, It also requires the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to understand God's Word fully. Jesus promised that the Spirit would, John 14 and 26, teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. Hallelujah. It's not only important to uh, uh, have the Holy Ghost for the resurrection power, but also to fully understand the Scripture and the Word. The Holy Ghost also will show us, as John 16 and 30 
John 16 and 13, it'll show us things to come. The Lord gives an understanding of His prophetic word to those who will walk with Him. He also gives understanding of the direction that His church and the world are going to take during the end times. See 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 4. The Spirit also gives righteousness, peace, and joy. Romans 14 and 17, we kind of already touched on that, but also the Spirit imparts the love of God inside of individuals. You know, with all this uh, things that are going on in this world, we, you know, all the division that's going on the, the, and, and the differing in opinions and people are bickering and bickering and there's anarchy in our streets and, and people are crying out to racism. Do you know what we need in this day and age? We need a baptism of love. We need a baptism of the Spirit of God inside of our churches, inside of our homes, inside of our school systems, inside of our lives. And how do we get that a baptism of love? We get it by receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We need more individuals, more men and women and children receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost in this hour. I believe that's our answer. I believe that's the key. Just like the Apostle Apostle Peter preached in the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2. We need to repent of our sins. We need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And yes, we need to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost so that God's love can abound in us in this world and unify us together. Unify our churches together. Unify races together. Unify this uh, nation back together again. We need a revival of the infilling of the Holy Ghost in each and every one of our lives. And if you've already received it, we need a renewing of it. Hallelujah. We need a God just, God's Spirit just to fall upon us afresh all over again. Renew us, God, daily in the Spirit. Hallelujah. And let love prevail. Let God's Spirit prevail in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I'm going to close this up tonight. But as I close, I want us all to pray. Hallelujah. Let's pray that God would search our hearts. That God, The scripture says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then he will heal our land. Hallelujah. So I want us to pray. And let's pray that God first would search our hearts, that we would, we would repent, we would turn from our wicked ways. And then secondly, if you have not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins by immersion, hallelujah, I, send me an email. We would love to connect with you. We would love to, to uh, uh, provide that opportunity for you. And then if you haven't received the gift of the Holy Ghost, it, you don't have to be in a church service. You you don't have to be uh, wherever you're at. I, I believe that God can fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost right where you are. Amen. What, what do you need? You need godly sorrow. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. You need to repent of your sins. Oh, hallelujah. And I believe God can touch you and even fill you with the Holy Ghost. You don't have to be baptized first. God can baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And then you can get a hold of us and we can baptize you in water. But I want us to pray. I want us to seek God's face. I want us to touch the Lord. And then even after I pray, uh, if you feel like you need to keep on praying in your maybe in your room or wherever you're at, you just keep on praying and keep seeking God's face and study these scriptures out. Hallelujah. And, and I believe that God, God is going to draw you closer. God, you're going to feel the power and the presence of the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we love you and we praise you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your glory. God, I thank you, Lord, for the way that you have paved for us. God, I thank you for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, God, you have, you have provided a way, God, for us to die with you in repentance. God, you provided a way for us to be buried with you in baptism. God, and you provided a way, Lord, for us to be resurrected again into the hope of glory, God, by receiving the power of the Holy Ghost in each and every one of our lives. God, I praise you and I worship you and I pray that you would search our hearts, try our thoughts, know our ways, God. Forgive us if there be any wicked thing, Lord, found in us. And I pray, God, your spirit would be with us and draw us closer, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Everybody said in Jesus' name. 
and amen. Well, God bless each and every one of you tonight. Uh, I appreciate you. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, and uh, we'll be praying for you. And there is, I believe, your future is as bright as the promises of God. And I don't know about you, but I want to claim every single promise for me that's found in this good book. And one of those promises is the gift of the Holy Ghost, and it's for you. It's for you today in Jesus' name. I appreciate you. I love you. God bless each and every one of you. Have a blessed week. Again, uh, go with God in Jesus' name.